It is so good to meet together today. We welcome you. And I was just sitting there thinking about what joy God must have had when he was creating you and me. Because he said, you know, I'm going to do something that no one would ever think I'd do. I'm going to create someone in my image. They'll never be God, but they're going to be an awful lot like me. And I'm sure he got excited about that. And when he did that, he created unbelievable potential in us. Sin has messed a lot of that up, but we still have talents and abilities and possibilities that are built into each of our lives that are so unique and personal and, and so good. And then God had another idea. He said, you know what? Instead of living around those people and being with those people, I'm going to live in those people. And so along with our talents and our gifts and our abilities that we have naturally because we're a human being, when we get saved, there's a big idea that happens. And I want to show you what that big idea is. God has given every believer spiritual gift or gifts. I believe God gives every believer a primary gift. We're going to talk about it today. And I think some of them have also a secondary gift, perhaps. But it's our way, it's our adventure to discover and develop those gifts so, now watch, we can be a blessing to others. What we have to understand is our gifts or gifts as a believer in Jesus Christ are given not for our benefit, but for God to use our lives to be a blessing to others. Let me read you a couple of scriptures that say that. First Peter 4.10, Peter tells us this. He said, God has given each of you who know Christ as your Savior, each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts, and then he says, use them well to serve one another. Paul says the same kind of thing over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 and 7. Notice what it says. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. I want you to understand this. He says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. One of our core values here at Simple Church is we are saved to serve. So the minute you come to know Christ as Savior and the forgiver of your sin and the leader of your life, the Holy Spirit comes to take his presence within us. And we saw last week, he does a whole bunch of things for us. But one of the big things is he gives us an ability, a supernatural ability, a spiritual ability to serve other people. And Nicky Gumbel, a guy who wrote uh, the, and, and he actually did the series called Alpha Course, it's gone worldwide. It's a fabulous course, but he made a cool statement about this. He said, the church is like a football game. There are 22,000 people in the stands in desperate need of exercise, <laughs> watching 22 people on the field desperately in need of rest. And he said, man, the church is an awful lot like that. we got all of these people who need to exercise what they're doing, but we got just a few down here doing the work. And what God is saying to us is, I've equipped every single one of you who know me, I've equipped you to do something special that no one else can do exactly like you can do it, and it will bless all the other people. So last week, we learned about spiritual gifts, and it's kind of interesting how the Bible tells us about them, because it gives us a list of gifts that are given by the Spirit. Those are basically in 1 Corinthians, and, and they're gifts like healing and tongues and interpretation of tongues and miracles. Those kind of gifts were given to the disciples and the apostles to prove to people that what they were saying was the word of God. They didn't have the Bible back then. And so when the apostles spoke and the disciples taught, 
these miracles that were done, the speaking in tongues, all of those things were the Spirit's gift to give authority to the Word of God. And then Paul tells us about uh, what are called ministry gifts. And those gifts are apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And those are given to the church to build up the church and to help the people grow into maturity, into the likeness of Christ. But what we want to look at today is the third set of gifts. And those are called the motivational gifts. In other words, they're a gift that's given to each of us. There may be a secondary one also for some, but there's a main thing that just kind of cooks inside of you. And it's how you are gifted to express your faith, to express God's truth, to express God's love to other people. It's how you are equipped and motivated to serve others. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at these gifts and we're going to kind of discover and define them today. This is kind of an academic lesson, but I, I hope you'll stay alert and awake through it. Because what I'm hoping you'll do is you'll start to get a taste of one of these, or maybe two, but one of these that really cooks inside you. You kind of say, as I define these seven, you kind of say, man, that's what motivates me. That's where I am best equipped to serve in the kingdom of God. And then next week, Brandon's going to help you discover your gift. It's going to be fun. You're going to have a great time. So I want to encourage you to be here for that next week. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us this morning. Father, it is so good to meet in this place in the name of Jesus with these dear friends. And to come to a point where we just are telling you we love you, we believe in you, and we want to just know how to serve you better and how to serve people better. We want to know how to be those Christians that just let you flow out of our lives every day so that others are experiencing you daily through us. We love you. And uh, I pray that you'll teach us well today, Holy Spirit. You're the only one who can do that. I can't. You can. So help us to hear and understand. And Lord, I agree with my brother, Bill, Eric, that uh, the way that uh, our hearts are burdened today for the great nation of Israel but also for all of the people over there, Palestinians and Israelites, who are, who are just uh, so scared and so afraid and so hurting. I pray for leadership over there and all throughout the world to be wise in everything that's done. And Lord, all we know to do is to pray for them and believe you for them and then say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May that be true there, may that be true here today, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the first motivational gift that's listed in uh, Romans, let me show you that portion of Scripture in Romans, if I may, okay? If you go back to Romans, I, f I forgot to read it. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, okay? Here's this scripture that tells us. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, that's the first gift, then speak out with as much faith as God has given you. And if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving Give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. There's seven different gifts there that he says these are what one of these is going to motivate you. So that first gift was the gift of prophecy. It comes from the Greek word prophetin and tia, and it means this. One who is motivated to see the truth of God's will revealed to all people. This motivational gift of prophecy is the ability to receive a divinely inspired message and deliver it to others in the church. It can be a, a word of exhortation. It can be a word of correction. It can be a word of inspiration. It can be a word of comfort. It can be a disclosure of some secret sin. 
It can be a prediction of future events. The person with the gift of prophecy has the ability to be very straightforward, kind of usually black and white, the way they look at things. Now understand something. Believers with the motivational gift of prophecy in the New Testament are different than those who had it in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when the prophets came, they would come and they would speak boldly the word of God, and they would always say, thus says the Lord. And what that meant was, this is God's word to you because I am a prophet who is inspired by God to give you his word. That was the Old Testament prophet. In the New Testament, we have his word, the Bible. It's revealed and it's given to us. And so the prophet in the New Testament, the, 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 their words don't constitute the authoritative word of God, but they are human interpretations of the revelation that was received to equip and edify the body of Christ. So today, instead of speaking God's word as if it's him speaking to you, they're speaking from the Bible. They're teaching and correctly and boldly and sometimes evangelistically proclaiming the word of God. So the strengths of a prophet are these. They can quickly identify good and evil. They are outspoken. They're very frank and they don't mince words. They're kind of people who get right in your face. Okay. They're prophets. They're not afraid. They'll just speak it out. And, they'll say, and they don't care if it, if it hurts you. And they don't care if it's, uh, if it's rough. If it's truth, they're going to speak truth. Now, the problem with prophets is sometimes they can be judgmental, and they can often be intolerant of different views from their own. Okay? So there are going to be people in the church, and to be honest with you, in the Old Testament, they got their heads cut off. In, in the New Testament, people may not like them as well. <laughs> but they're people that just, you know, whether you like it or not, this is the way it is. This is God's word. Listen to it. There are preachers that are preached like that. There are others that don't preach like that. But, boy, they're bold and they're powerful. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 through 21, do not scoff at prophecies. In other words, if someone is making a word of truth to you, don't scoff at it. Don't turn your back on it. But, he says, test everything that it is said and hold on to what is good. In other words, test everything they say according to the word of God. Is what they're saying true? If it is, then you better listen to it because that's a gift that God gives to some people just to boldly speak the truth. They're often great evangelists and they'll just tell people, you're going to hell if you don't know Jesus. And they don't really care if the people don't like it because that's God's word. You better hear it. That's a prophet. The second gift is the gift of serving. Serving is a gift that will be predominant in the gifts in the church. Because servants can do almost anything, but they'll always do it from, hey, how can I help? Let me show you the definition. Serving is one who easily recognizes practical needs and is quick to meet them to energize the church and free up others to use their gifts to the fullest. We have several people here in our church like that. They just obviously have the gift of serving because when there's a need, they're always there. there. There are other stinkers who don't give a rip, okay? But they're, I'm kidding when I say that, kind of. Uh, but the thing is that, that, that there, are, there are some of these people who just, they're just always there. What do you need? How can I help? I'm ready, boy. You know? That's the gift of serving. The Greek word that best describes that is diakonia. It means to wait tables, to serve. It's any act of service done in genuine love for the edification of the community. Okay? The servants just say, how can I help? Huh? Jesus set the example for all gifted servants and, and really for all of us as Christians over in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Here's what he said. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Servants love to be in the background 
And they find it hard to be served by others because they love to serve others. Now, what's interesting about a servant, though, is if they sense that their service is unappreciated, many times they can get hurt feelings about that. So that's the gift of serving, and it, it, it just cooks within some people. Boy, anytime you call on them, yeah, yeah. You don't want to abuse that, but man, they're ready to help and serve. Third gift is the gift of teaching. Here's what that is. It's one who is motivated to research, understand, and impart knowledge of the truth of God's word. It comes from the Greek word didaskalos, which is to teach, instruct, explain, and instill doctrine. So, so someone who has this gift of didaskalos, of, of teaching, they will, they are people that just love to read. They love to study. They love to understand. They love to know truths. They're the ones that write these big books on theology and they write books that help us to really understand God. And they preach messages that really teach us the deeper things of the word of God. This, this gift of teaching, it's greatest joy is to see people uphold God's word and grow into maturity and obedience to Christ. And, and what's interesting is, without that gift, the church will eventually move into areas of error and disobedience. The gift of teaching is so important uh, so that we understand and know how to take God's word and deal with it correctly and then let it be used in our lives to make us more like Christ. So James, however, gives a word of warning to teachers. It's over in James chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. In other words, if you're going to say, I'm going to teach, then you better, you better study hard. Make sure you're teaching God's word and not your thoughts, but the truth, okay? We have several in our church who are teachers. They love to study. Alan Hulling is one of our advisory team members, and he's got a large library, and he just loves to study and study, and he's a great teacher, and he's leading in one of our house churches. So thankful for that. Don Morris, the guy that I worked with uh, for years, I'm going to talk to him about two things because he loved to study and he loved to teach. And he's so proud of his library of 5,000 books, which would bore me to tears. And he's got them all over his house, these big shelves of books, you know. And he's probably read half of them. It's amazing. Someone with a gift of teaching... That's what they love to do. They love to study and know the truth. And, and, and then they, if they get a chance, they like to teach it to others because they want people to obey the word of God. Teaching is a great gift, but teachers can be slow to learn from other people and they can develop pride in their intellectual ability. And so teachers have great strengths, but along with strengths always come some potential things to watch out for. The fourth gift is the gift of encouragement or exhortation to encourage other people. This is a person who is motivated to participate in the process of self and others, of themselves and others, growing closer to God and into the likeness of Jesus Christ. What, what exhorters love to do is they love to take the word of God and to know it, but then they love to take it and make sure it's applied personally, individually, into people's lives. This comes from the Greek word parakaleto, and it's to beseech, to exhort, to call upon, to encourage, to comfort, to strengthen. Someone with a gift of exhortation just loves to sit down one-on-one -on -one with someone. Listen to their story and then pour out God's word to them. This gift accepts people as they are. Usually they say, hey, I'm going to meet you right where you are. I'm not going to judge you about anything in your past, but I do want to help you from this day on know how to take the word of God and apply it to your life and live according to the word of God and be unwavering in your faith. 
uh, people usually like to be around those kind of people because they are encouraging. They, 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 they build up, they comfort, they strengthen, they call up strength in people's lives. However, an exhorter can also be someone who rebukes people in order to foster spiritual growth. If they have to rebuke someone, it's because they want them to take the word of God and just grow in it and become more and more that kind of person. This gift is helpful, but it has the tendency to interrupt others in eagerness to give advice. Uh, this is the gift that I have. And um, I've spent all my life trying to figure out how to best utilize that in ministry because I'm not a prophet, and, uh, and you're going to find out another gift called mercy. I'm not merciful. I try to be nice, but I'm not merciful. I don't have that gift. But I have the gift of exhortation. And what's interesting when I, when I meet with someone in personal counseling uh, I have to struggle because after they've told me five minutes of their story, I already know the 17 points I'm going to give them, you know, to correct everything, okay? And I have to sit there for another 25 minutes and listen to their story. I already know what I'm going to tell them, you know? Exhorters struggle with that because the best way you can help and encourage people is to listen to their story, keep your mouth shut. Then if you have something to say that'll help, feel free to do that. That's the gift of exhortation. It's, a, it's an interesting gift. Um, then there's the gift of giving. That's a number five. Giving is, a, is, a, is an interesting gift. This is a person who is motivated to give from all their resources to further the work of God in people's lives. It comes from the Greek word metadidomai, which means to impart to others sincerely, generously, and without pretense or hypocrisy. Givers are people who love to use their possessions, their time, their energy, and their love to be able to help other people. Now, all of us should be generous and all of us should be givers, but there are people who just are motivated. Many times, they're not always the rich people, but they know how to manage everything, their time, their talents, their resources, their money. They know how to manage it in such a way that they have it there to give and to help and to bless other people when they are in need. They are typically hospitable. They are excellent stewards who adjust their lifestyles to help others and to spread the gospel. And the, the thing that givers have to be careful about, though, is that if others are not generous or if they see people who are, they think are not generous, they have a tendency to judge them and think that they should be more generous than they are because it just, yeah, it just flows from my life. We have people in this church who are like that. Uh, they have uh, been so generous, we couldn't even begin to do what we do if it weren't for those people who have that gift of giving. We all should be giving time, talents, treasures. We should be generous with that. But there are some that just, that's their passion. Uh, we had a person in need here in our church this past week, and, and uh, we helped in several ways to help meet the need of that person. But last Sunday as I walked out the door, uh, this one person was standing there saying, man, is, is there something we can do? Is there some way we need to help? I, we're ready to help in any way. That, that person has the gift of giving. It's just amazing to see how that flows when there's a need. The sixth gift is leadership ability. Another closely associated gift to that is administration. They kind of can go together, and yet they're, they're really different. One, this is a person who is motivated by envisioning the will of God and working with people and resources to achieve it. It comes from the Greek word kubernesis, and it refers to, and this is interesting, th that gift of, of leadership refers to a, um, a, a uh, captain, uh, literally uh, a shipmaster. Someone who steers, someone who rules, someone who governs. And it has the idea of someone who guides and directs a group of people toward a goal or destination with clarity. 
Leaders are something else because they are the people that can have a vision for something and then they can, can, can lead the people to get motivated to want to do that. And usually they're even willing to stay in the background and let other people have the prominence just so the vision gets accomplished. Leadership deals more, and this is an important understanding. Leadership deals more with the ideas and setting the goals while administration deals more with organizing to get the task done. Um, when I was pastor at First Federated Church in Beaverdale years ago, God led me in seminary to be uh, just in a, to a great relationship with another guy there. His name is Don Morris. And he and I went out and we pastored on weekends in churches while we were in school. And then we got a church in Michigan that we pastored for three and a half years while we were finishing off school. And then we came to Des Moines and, and came to Federated. And, and uh, within six months, things just started exploding. And what was interesting, working with Don, not only were we great friends, and we still are to this day, but um, I had more of a vision of... Uh, are uh, uh, a gift of kind of seeing stuff and, 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 and envisioning stuff and thinking what could happen. And Don had the ability to make it happen. He had this gift of, of administration. He was a leader. He led well. But he had this gift of taking that vision and making it happen. And it was so cool. The, the paper started calling us the dynamic duo, which we weren't. But, and I hate the name, really, but they did that be only because they saw that there could be a vision and then it could get done. And if in, in the church, you see, all of these things I'm talking to you about today, it takes all of these things to make the church be the church that's like a light on the hillside pointing people to Christ. Everybody has their Part, and everybody does their part. And when one person can envision something and the other person comes along and says, now I can take that and make it happen. Because to be honest with you, I had dreams and visions like you couldn't dream. I was kind of sick, okay? Don was the one that made the stuff happen. If I had to make it happen, I'd stop having dreams and thoughts and visions and ideas because that's just the way it works. And so we complimented each other so much. Leaders can become upset, however, when others don't share the same vision or organization that they, that they, uh, they, uh, that they do, uh, that organized plan. If people don't catch that, they can get upset. The final gift is this, mercy and compassion. And I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, I, I, I think I'm nice and I try to be that loving Pastor Tom, okay? But... Uh, mercy is not my gift. I hate visiting in hospitals. Okay? I, I don't like having to cry with people. I'm not real merciful. Can I confess that to you and you still think I'm okay? All right? Because that's it. I, I mean, I, I, I've told you before, one time I got a burden to go see someone in the hospital and I didn't make hospital calls. Another guy always did at church, at Federated. And I went into this room and this woman was shocked. She said, am I that bad? In other words, <laughs> she, she thought she was dying because I came to visit her in the hospital. Because uh -huh. it was known Tom doesn't go to hospitals very much. That's Peter Bergen. Now, now that guy, he was on our staff and he was one of the pastors there. When, when he'd walk into a hospital room, people would think Jesus had just walked into that room. They just loved it when Peter called. When I came, they thought they were dying, okay? So it was an interesting thing. But anyway, let me tell you about mercy and we're through, okay? Mercy and compassion. This is a person who is motivated to identify with the emotions of others and show God's love. The Greek word is aleo, and it means to be patient and compassionate toward those who are suffering or afflicted and to provide emotional support. And there are some people that, man, they're just looking for people hurting. People cry, man, they'll come over, put their arm, well, you know. You know why? Because they want to cry with those who cry. They want, to, they want to feel with those who are hurting. They want to empathize with those in pain. 
This gift has tremendous capacity to, to show empathy for people in trials and suffering and it can come alongside hurting people for an extended period of time. Mercy looks for the good in people and it's drawn to hurting people so they can cry with those who cry and take action needed to remove hurts and relieve distress in others. They're typically good listeners. They'll sit and listen to you, tell your story, share your hurt, know your pain, and they'll do it for an extended period of time. They're willing to be there for others. It's a marvelous gift. And every church needs those kind of people that, that have that kind of compassion because not everyone will be motivated that way. Every one of us should be loving and kind and gracious and compassionate and accepting towards each other. But some will just cook that way. They may not be able to even manage their resources to give as much. They may not know how to, to lead anything. But they'll know how to come alongside someone who's hurting and just be there and be such an encouragement and such a strength for that person. Now, the problem with people with this gift is they can easily tend to take up, and this is really important to understand, easily tend to take up another's person offense and can easily be hurt by people. People with the gift of mercy, they have a tendency to listen to just one side of the story because I care about you and I'm going to get so involved in your life. I'm going to listen to you and they don't listen or know there's another side to the story. And sometimes that can create real problems. And they have a tendency to get hurt if someone doesn't treat them just exactly right. So with every gift, there's a strength there's a motivation, there's a power that's offered to serve. And with every gift, we have our weaknesses also. We have to learn those. So we're going to, these next two weeks, we're going to discover the gifts and, and, and your gift. You're going to discover your gift, and then you're going to learn more of how to utilize that and let it flow and let it really be used. Now, the reason we're teaching this this month is because we really want the people, all of us, to know who we are in the body. And two weeks from today, we'll see that very clearly in Scripture. And we want to know how we can best be used to serve others. Because when all of us are doing our job, man, a place becomes a powerhouse for God. Because the people there are taken care of, and then that spreads all over the community for the glory of God. So, did you get a little taste of where you might be? Did you get a little idea of maybe how you, you know, you have to experience this. You have to, to do it some, but, but many of you maybe are starting to get a little bit of an idea of where you cook best. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do other things when there's a need in the church, but it basically means you want to find out how can I best be used in this area of my giftedness to affect the best result in the body of Christ. So next week, you'll be discovering your gift, and I, I want to encourage you to listen carefully to what Brandon says at the end here because he's going to give you some instructions for that. And as you and I discover and know our gifts, your opportunity and your responsibility will be to ask God and, and maybe talk with us about where your gift can fit best into the ministry of Simple Church or in your world, wherever God has you. Because God wants to use you all week long with your gift to serve others, to bless others, to represent Him well before others. The important thing is that we discover, develop, and use our gifts to the glory of God and for the benefit of all that God brings into our lives. So let's pray. Father, as we've had this more academic kind of lesson today, I pray that you'll help it to, to cause us all to start understanding more that, that we are a valuable part. 
we're not just a consumer. We're not just a bench warmer. We are here to, to, to be used of you, to glorify your name and to serve the people that you bring into our lives on a daily basis and to serve them well with a gift that you've enabled us to have. So I thank you for every person in this room, and I thank you for the power and potential of our lives in Christ and for every one of us who know you, Jesus, as Savior. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for the gift that you've given us. Help us to know it, develop it, and use it fully for your glory. May that strengthen this church. May it help us to be more and more like Christ. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.